Redeemer, welcome to our worship service this morning as a family of God. We're going to do a call to worship together this morning from Psalm 95, 1 through 7. So it'll be a part for me to read, and then where it says God's people, you will read, and you'll follow along. We'll do this together. All right. All right, let's do it. Psalm 95, 1 through 7. Come, let us sing joyfully to the Lord. Let us give a loud shout to the rock who saves us. Let us approach his presence with thanksgiving. With music, we will shout to him. For the Lord is the great God and the great King above all gods. He holds the unexplored places of the earth in his hand. And the peaks of the mountains belong to him. The sea belongs to him, for he made it, and his hands form the dry land. And together, come, let us bow down, let us revere him, let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the flock in his hand. Let's pray as we continue to worship. Father, we come before you this morning. You're an amazing, all-powerful, all-loving, and also personal God. We are excited to be here to sing joyfully to you. Fill us up with who you are, with wonder at who you are, so that we can go forth from here today to continue to love you and also to love those who you bring into our paths. We pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, if you'll just join me in prayer. Thank you, Father God, for your word. Because it's through your word that we can know you and we can hear your voice more clearly. Thank you, Lord, that you call us to do hard things that take us away outside our comfort zone and can only be accomplished through your enabling. You, Lord, provided absolutely everything, even before we know we need it. Who but you would know that I would be asked to do this prayer? And in preparation, you directed me to a book on my shelf with 366 devotions from 21 centuries of godly women who you used greatly for your kingdom purposes. And then as I struggled with how to put it all together, you literally led me to a little book, Women and God, that just came in the mail that I didn't even know I had. You call us to do hard things, but you give us all that we need to do it. And all that's required of us is to step out in faith. Throughout the scriptures, your word shows us your consistent goodness toward women who are created in your image. Women like Abigail, like Deborah, the most godly leader in the book of Judges, like Esther, who delivered the children of God from supreme peril, and the powerful stories of Ruth and Rahab, and that you chose a woman, Father God, to bring our Savior into the world, a Savior who then appeared first to women after his resurrection. These stories in the scripture show much about women of faith, but it shows even more about the faithful God they trusted and served. Throughout the scriptures and in our world today, we see that when evil is unrestrained, women often become the victims of oppression by evil men. And yet some of the brightest light and the darkest places of the salvation history shines for women who were called to serve God, who did so faithfully, playing a crucial part in the story of redemption. The focus not on the greatness of the woman, but on the greatness of the Lord God she serves. Today in the culture surrounding us as believers, we live constantly confronted by all sorts of evil. And your word shows us ways in which you use faithful people, including strong, godly women, for your good purposes in the midst of dark circumstances. Father God, direct our steps that we lift high the cross of Jesus before us and devote our lives to others, showing abundant hospitality to strangers with charity and biblical counsel to those in need. Thank you, Father God, that throughout your word, the scripture shows us that the women are to be valued as created in the image of God, along with men, and that all believers are filled and empowered with the spirit of the risen Christ to serve you and however you've gifted us to serve you until you come again. 
Father, I just lift up Mary as she teaches that you will give power to her words and that each of us can hear exactly what you want us individually to hear. And it'll be different because you call us in different ways. And all these things, I pray in the powerful and the holy name of all names. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Deb. Uh, good morning again. We've been uh, doing a series on how to get people, how to help people, how to disciple people back to their feet again when they're bound up by life-dominating sins. We've been approaching Paul's epistles for the last couple of months and showing the blueprint that God gives us rather than what the church has told us for so many years about to help somebody who's enslaved, or to use a modern word, but not a biblical word, addicted. And so uh, one person uh, who's part of our congregation now has asked that he be able to share a little bit about his story on his travel back to getting on his feet again. And so I said, yeah, this is a good Sunday to do it. So without any further explanation, I'm gonna ask that Dave go ahead and uh, share his story. Dave, can I give you this microphone? Sure. Hello everyone, my name is David Scott, and most of my life I was a heavy drinker since my late teens, and it just gradually got worse and worse, and that addiction led into drugs and stuff, but I was able to get clean off the drugs, but the drinking is just the one constant. And I hated doing it, but I always did it, and I always told myself, just don't do it, just stop. And that never worked, because then before I knew it, I was six years in and ready for more. Nine weeks ago, I, I came to Pastor Tim for help, because I couldn't do it alone. And that was the last time I've had a drink, it was nine weeks ago. I never thought I could do this. But I did it with his guidance and God's guidance, which I didn't really... I never really put God with addiction and how to get clean from it. I always just tried doing it on myself or doing AA or you know stuff like that. It just never worked. So I just want to say that tomorrow I'll be nine weeks. I'll call free. Amen. 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 See. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we are in this series on how to pe help people get back on their feet, and it's not an easy one. I have focused for the last few months on what Paul has to say about these issues. He gives us the blueprint pretty much as to how to help people get back on their feet, whether the addiction is uh, drugs, pornography, gambling, nicotine, uh, sports, athletics, nose drops, chocolate, weightlifting. There's all sorts of addictions because our culture is very, very pro self-indulgence. So it's not surprising to find addictions and enslavement is just everywhere. Well, <clears throat> there's one particular touchy subject in today's culture is what role does a woman have in restoring people? And what role does women have in restoring men? Remember, Paul says in Galatians 6, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness. He didn't say elders do it, or deacons do it, or the pastor does it. Or the leaders do. He said, those of you who are spiritual, those people who bear the fruit of the Spirit. So I thought, you know, there is a story in the Old Testament of a woman, 1 Samuel 25, Abigail, who basically keeps a man from blood guilt. She intervenes as a queen, as a prophet, and as a priest, and saves a young man in his anger from becoming a murderer. And that story is placed in between chapter 24 and 26, where David had a chance to kill Saul, and he did not. And in between, he loses control because of what? A personal offense. And a woman is sent by God to speak the word of God and saves him from blood guilt. So I've asked Mary, who is a real teacher of canonical Bible study, how to approach the Bible canonically to show how all women here can take that role. Maybe in the role of a man who you know is an angry, 
out of control male who is governed by his emotions. You women can be used of God to save a man from destruction and even perhaps murder. So thank you for your attention and I ask you now to just put your hands together to welcome Mary to our teaching platform this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, so we will be talking from 1 Samuel 25 this morning, but I just want to reiterate what Pastor Cole just reminded us of from the last couple of months from his teaching. We have been working through this series on restoration of brothers and sisters. Those aren't people who are different from us. Those are people that we love and they're here with us. These are just people, you know, that we don't know that are outside or they're just different. I mean, these are our brothers and sisters that we're called to help uh, restore, to restore out of being trapped and enslaved to sin. Um, and that job of restoration, like Pastor Cole just reminded us, isn't for special elite people who are pastors or elders or deacons or just men. This is a job for all Christians to engage in um, because, like Paul says in Galatians 6, those who are walking by the Spirit, and we know we have the Spirit if we have believed in the name of Jesus. That is the requirement uh, to receive the Spirit. It's not our own works. If we believe in the name of Jesus, He gives us His Spirit, and His Spirit produces life in us. And that life, that reception of the Spirit, and that walking in the Spirit is the reason that we ought to restore one another. And we've gone through New Testament passages about that from Paul in Galatians and Colossians and Ephesians. But today I want to bring us to an Old Testament story, which Old Testament stories and even the gospel narratives are a different way of teaching us. Paul will just tell us what to do in the epistles, but in narratives and stories, the writers show us theology. They show us what God's people ought to do and what they should look like and how they should live. And so that um, with that understanding, we're going to go through an Old Testament story to see the story that will tell us how we ought to live. Because I know from listening to these messages from Pastor Bull, if we're responsible for doing the work of restoration, and it's my responsibility and your responsibility, then we really need to know what to do. And the question becomes, are we ready? Are we comfortable? Do we know what to do? Or are we, God forbid, going to see someone on the path of destruction and sit in silence because we don't know what to do or we're so nervous or we're going to mess it up that we let them self-destruct? I mean, as much as it is our responsibility to help to intervene. Um, and this story, I think, is a good example to men and women, certainly, of why we should and how we can consider doing restoration in relationships. Specifically here in 1 Samuel 25, and you can turn there. We're not going to read too much of it word for word. Um, it's 43 verses, so it's pretty long, and I don't want to take up too much of our time just straight reading the narrative. But um, it is this woman, Abigail, who will be showing us what restoration looks like in a believing man, David, a woman's words, a woman's voice is what keeps this man from immense guilt before God. And there are two broad takeaways that I want us to get ready for up front and be keeping in mind as we move through this story. First is that Abigail shows us that our words to one another matter. And I think we all know that. We all agree with that already. But her words matter at the crucial moment for changing this man's life around and restoring him. The content of our conversations with one another can assist each other in staying on the path of God's will, and that is to love him and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Our words can bring someone back from the brink of destruction. And the second major point in that takeaway that I want us to keep thinking about as we move through the narrative is that this story of Abigail Turning David back from murder is a positive retelling and reframing of the story of Eden and the fall in Genesis 3 
And I think it's essential for us to grasp the parallels between this text and the text of Genesis 1 through 3, not just for the benefit of seeing this incredible interconnectedness in all of scripture, but for truly understanding the theology that the writers are trying to teach us and show us. Because if there are parallels here, between here and Eden, then Abigail and David are a new Adam and Eve. And they're successful in God fearing Adam and Eve, or at least David is eventually at the end of the story. But when we see that, we see that they're a new Adam and Eve. We remember that we're new creations made by Jesus and brought to life by his spirit and enabled, we are especially enabled, to obey God and to walk with him because of the spirit. And we can then look at this story as an example of how God's garden kingdom should have looked in Genesis 3 and how the restoring of God's garden kingdom ought to look now. And that restoration of the garden kingdom is brought about through God using regular people. I mean, we are regular people. I don't feel like a superstar Christian. I'm a regular Christian. But God will use me and you, especially if you feel like that, to carry out and to produce garden living now, a restoration of Eden now. So let's get into the text of 1 Samuel 25 and start seeing those Eden parallels. And then we'll look more closely at Abigail's words to David and his response that rescue and restore him. Okay, so 1 Samuel 25 one uh, B, we'll start seeing this, and you can kind of read along as I tell you what's going on here. First, we're going to read about God's man in a wilderness, in the desert, who goes up to Carmel. Um, Carmel literally means the garden of God. And this, of course, is parallel to Genesis 1, as God turns the wasteland, like this desert, into a mountain orchard. Then we also notice as we keep reading that there is an evil man who is introduced. And his work is in the garden of God in Carmel. His wife is contrasted to him, this evil man. And she's literally good tove of understanding. And she's beautiful of appearance. Um, we see this paired contrast, like in the garden of good and evil, throughout the narrative, but especially brought to light here. And Abigail is the one who knows the difference between the two? She's notably insightful. You'll see this word used throughout the Proverbs, uh, the word here for insight or good understanding. Um, and that's parallel to the tree of knowledge and um, that is good for wisdom, that at least Eve thinks so. Um, and we read that this woman is beautiful just like that tree was. It's good to remember that and reflect on that pattern because when we see the beautiful tree and then we see these beautiful people popping up, we know that this story is going to present a temptation in some way. And so we're noticing that as we're reading through uh, 1 Samuel 25. Okay, so now David, it gets more specifically to David. David sends his men up to Carmel to communicate with this man who is the provider and the overseer and the owner of all of this food that's being talked about. We're coming up to a feast day, um, and, and he's responsible for giving out food to the people. Um, but David discovers through conversation, just like with the snake, through conversation that Nabal is evil, and it, that shows us, the reader, that he is the enemy in the garden. He is the newest seed of the servant, speaking to God's man in a garden concerning food. So I think that's pretty clear when we spell it out really quick like that, that this uh, narrative is set up to look like Eden. And so this enemy, this antagonistic, taunting enemy, speaks to David, and here comes the problem. Here comes the temptation that we're expecting. David, like Pastor Cole mentioned at the beginning, is so offended by what Nabal has said to him. He's so full of angry pride that he calls for 400 of his warriors, 400 of his warriors to strap on their swords. And it's mentioned three times in quick succession. They, 
he called them to strap on their swords, he strapped on their swords, and they strapped on their swords. Um, and we're not going to get into the parallels today, but there's more canonical parallels here back to 1 Samuel 17 when David is fighting Goliath and he rejects the sword at that time and he fights in the name of the Lord. Here, he's ready to go. 400 of his men, they're going up, they're strapped up with their swords, and they're going to go kill Nabal and all of the males of his household over being refused food. I mean, Nabal was absolutely evil and antagonistic and taunting, but David's response is way out of proportion for what has happened. And so, one of Nabal's servants hears about this. He hears about what his master has said to David, and we find out that David is on the path to committing this grave sin. And this servant comes up to Abigail and asks her to intervene. But I want to stop here because it's really important to see that the descent into sin in the garden, Eve's descent into sin, was stopped by nobody. No one intervenes. No one recalls the word of the Lord or the commands of the Lord. No one rescues Eve from her enemy and from her own descent into sin. But here in 1 Samuel 25, Abigail does what both Adam and Eve failed to do. She speaks up with reminders of the word and the will of God. She knows and obeys the word of God, and she acts as God's mouthpiece to turn David back from sin. Unlike Deb prayed this morning, God views women as equal to men. He did not reject this woman to be used by him to turn back King David. I mean, David is on his way to be king. I mean, he's one of the most important men of the whole entire Bible. God particularly spoke through a woman to this man. Let's see more contrast here between here and the garden. That first woman brought food to a man, and they both received discord and death. But this better Eve, used by God, brings a huge load of food to the new Adam, and they all, everyone in the story, receives peace and life because of what she's done. And this is the point in the narrative where everything turns around, when this servant has come and told Abigail what has happened. She turns things around and restores them to alignment with the garden kingdom by and through speaking God's will to David, reminding him of the role that God has assigned him. Um, let's go down to 1 Samuel 25, 14. This is where one of the servants comes and tells Abigail what has happened. And verse 17, encourage her, he encourages her by saying, Know and see what you should do, because evil is determined against our master and all of his house, and he's such a worthless man that no one can speak to him. It's really harsh. It was really, really harsh. And I think it's important to realize that this man, who is a man of Israel, is not going to be the focus of restoration. Especially when we consider that his name means fool, and we, at this point in time, have read Proverbs, and we know what a fool is like. Um, we... We know what's coming to him, and Abigail, and even their servants, know what this man is like, and she does not go to him to restore wrongs. She goes to the man of God to restore wrongs, but she knows this. She's understanding this because she is the one in this text that knows the difference between good and evil. I mean, it's not just pastors who know good and evil. It's not just elders who know the difference between good and evil. Any man or woman of God who studies the word of God and learns the heart of God can know the difference between good and evil. And Abigail is the only one in this passage who does. Um, and she enacts, based on her wisdom and her knowledge, she enacts a plan for the tove, right, the benefit of everyone involved. She knows who to speak to. It isn't her husband. It isn't the fool. It's the man of God. And again, remember what I said about us restoring brothers and sisters? Brothers and sisters who believe in God and know God are still tempted uh, by evil and still sin, or might be 
enslaved to sin and trapped by sin, this man of God, I mean, King David, is entrapped by his own pride. But the word of God still makes a difference to him. The word of God comes to him through Abigail to change him around. Okay, let's keep moving here. Verse 18, Abigail descends from her high place, right? So the mountain, the mountain garden of God. She descends from her high place with haste and brings so much food along with her, all of these orchard-type foods um, and, a land, and some sheep that are already prepared to meet David on his path. She comes to meet him with haste. And it's repeated twice in this narrative. And now in verse 23, we read, When Abigail saw David, she hurried, this is the second time, she just hurried and got down from her donkey and fell before David on her face and bowed to the ground. <clears throat> right? She isn't repaying David's anger with more anger here. Let's see what she has to say. She fell at his feet and said, On me alone, my Lord, be the guilt. Please let your servant speak in your ears and hear the words of your servant. She's come with hate. She's come with food, but the power is going to be in her words. Let not my Lord, verse 25, regard this worthless fellow, Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. Again, literally, his name means folly or foolish. But I, your servant, did not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent. Now then, my Lord, as the Lord lives, this is an oath, as the Lord lives, and as your soul lives, because, this is interesting, because the Lord has restrained you from blood guilt and from saving with your own hand, now then, let your enemies and those who seek to do evil to my Lord be as Nabal. This woman, who has hurried to meet him, knows just what he needs, knows just what she needs to say. Look how she couches her instruction to him. Because the Lord, not me, because the Lord has restrained you as if it's already happening. This woman, as she has approached this man in, I mean, an absolute tyrant, he's, he's off to murder, I mean, a whole household worth of people, and an enormous household. This man has an, an enormous household. She has come to this man and has said, the Lord has restrained you from blood guilt and from saving with your own hand. She's very wise in how she's presenting this information to an angry man. She is saying, let me speak to you because the Lord is restraining you right now. He is restraining you by her, by her words. And we'll see David confirm this as we keep reading. And then verse 27, she says, Now let this present, the food, that your servant has brought to my Lord be given to the young men who follow my Lord. This was David's request to Nabal earlier. Please feed all of my men because we've kept good care of you. And then 28, please forgive the trespass of your servant. She is interceding for her husband like a priest. She is asking for the trespass to be on her and that she's going to take care of it. For the Lord will certainly, please do this because for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a short house because, and this is interesting again, look how she's couching this, because my Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord, the Yahweh of Israel Lord. But like I alluded to a little bit earlier, him strapping on his swords is proof that he's turned around from fighting the battles of the Lord. But she's encouraging him. Remember what you are called to do. Because my Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord. And if you keep doing that, and evil shall not be found in you as long as you live. She's very wise. She's telling him, get back on track here because what you are about to do is evil but God is preventing you through me coming to you to stop you from committing an evil 29 if the men rise up to pursue you and to seek your life the life of my Lord shall be bound in the middle of the bundle of the living in the care of the Lord your God and the lives of your enemies he shall sling out as from the hollow of a sling 
And when the Lord has done to my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you, see, she knows what God has said about David. And has appointed you as prince over Israel, my Lord shall have no cause of grief or pangs of conscience for having shed blood without cause. Or for my Lord from working salvation by his own hand. By saving himself and when the Lord has dealt well with my Lord then remember your servant she's calling all of this back up to mind with him God is stopping David from evil through her swift actions and her wise words Abigail knows what the Lord requires of David and she knows that her coming to speak to him is with reason is the way that the Lord is carrying David through and keeping him on his path to kingship without the stains of murder, murder on his hands. And David acknowledges this. This man who is so full of rage over a personal offense that he's going to murder people has heard her voice, has heard her reason, has heard from the Lord through her. Verse 32. He says, and David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who sent you this day to meet me. Blessed be your discretion, and blessed be you, who have kept me this day from blood guilt and from working salvation with my own hand. The construction here is putting his blessing of God and of Abigail as parallel to each other showing that God's blessing is coming to him through Abigail. So he's blessing God for what he's doing through Abigail and gives her this parallel blessing. And I, well, let me get to that in a second. <clears throat> he praises God for sending her and for her work. And later, oh, and later in verse 39, he says this all again and repeats it all again as praising God directly. And this is just confirmation again that um, Abigail's work is seen directly as God's work. She is his mouthpiece. She is his hands. And she is the feet of God. Verse 35. Then David received from her hand what she had brought him. Remember, he has just praised her for stopping him from working salvation with his own hand. And then David received from her hand what she had brought him, which is literally food. What has she brought him? Salvation from God, from his blood guilt. And he said to her, go up in peace to your house. See, I have listened, which has a connotation of obeying. See, I have listened to your voice and I have granted your petition. He has received food from this woman's hand. Just like Adam received food from Eve's hand. But what was the result? It wasn't death. Like it was in the first garden, there wasn't judgment, there weren't any curses. Instead, there was life and peace and clean hands. And David will, as we see, continue to trust in God to fight on his behalf after this episode. What did Adam receive judgment for? Listening to the voice of his wife when it was counter to the word of God. But here, David is restored through listening to the voice of this woman who, incidentally, becomes his wife at the end of the story. Um, but without Abigail's intervention, David would have forfeited the role God had assigned to him. And it's really hard to imagine Israel's history without King David, right? Can you imagine what the Old Testament, sort of huge portions of the Old Testament would have looked like or would have been? if he would have just failed here and not kept going, not ascended to the kingship. This woman doesn't hesitate 
This wise woman knew what God wanted, and she did it, and she said it. Abigail turns this narrative into a success. She turns the story of what was beginning to look like the fall in Eden into a story of restoration. And all of her work is hinged on knowing and speaking and doing the word of God, which is the exact opposite of what happened with Eve and with Adam and their enemy in the first garden. Here in 1 Samuel 25, Eden, God's garden kingdom is restored and the enemy of God at the end of the story is crushed by God himself. We'll move to takeaways here. Like I set us up for at the beginning. We are the new creations of Jesus who are to be walking by the Spirit, as we've been learning, and participating. We are supposed to be participating in the restoration work of the Garden Kingdom because restoration is a, a highlight, an important action of the Garden Kingdom. And part of that work of restoring Eden and restoring other people comes from God's people working that out and bringing it and continuing to bring it and continuing to spread it. We are restoring. We continue to do that, to bring life and peace and help pull each other up out of works of sin and destruction and death. But we, even though the kingdom is coming, the kingdom is spreading, we're still living in a time where it hasn't 100% come all the way yet. It hasn't fully arrived. We aren't living in the new heaven and the new earth yet. Our bodies haven't been glorified. Our, all of our tears haven't been wiped away yet. Um, so there's no surprise that we still need to be warned and still need to be encouraged to fight the enemy and to put to death our sins, just like David needed warning. We have still got to be, as we've been learning, taking off that old flesh and renewing our minds and putting on the new man. We've got to be fighting to put to death and dwelling sin. And we have that work to do personally, but we have that work to do together. Because restoration is a community project or a team project. And David, from the story, is a good example of a real believer, a man of God, but one who still needs to get rid of pride and anger that is about to eat him up and eat up his neighbors in his path. And Abigail is a valiant example of a woman of God, a sister in Christ, who is walking with God and is equipped to set that brother back on track, just as we remember Paul was exhorting the believers in Galatia to do. If a brother or sister falls into sin, you who have the spirit should restore him or her in a spirit of gentleness. The other takeaway I prepared us for at the beginning is a little more specific. It's not just life in God, God's garden kingdom must include restoration. That's the first one. The second one is, Abigail shows us that our words to one another matter for restoring men and women. Speaking the word of God is a tool of restoration. A person walking by the Spirit uses wisdom given by God to discern what is good and evil in our situations, in our communities, in our husbands, in our wives, in our children, in our friends, here together. And when we discern that, we speak the words of God and we do what is in alignment with the will of God, as revealed in Scripture, for each other. So how do we know the word of God? We must have a habit, and this isn't saying read your Bible because that will help you fight sin and you'll get rid of your sin. We need to read the Bible so that we're prepared. We need to know it. We need to love it. We need to saturate ourselves in it. We need to understand, get equipped to understand so that we're ready to go with haste like Abigail was to restore each other. In community, in relationships, we are meant to restore. We are meant to speak up. 
We are meant to do. We're meant to use the word of God and our knowledge of him to correct, to turn back, to encourage and motivate one another. And in so doing, this is the end, and in so doing, we will be helping bring the kingdom of God as citizens of God's garden kingdom by doing the kingdom work of restoration. I'll say that part again. When we're ready with the word of God and we're bringing the word of God to bear on our situations and in the lives of our brothers and sisters, we will be helping bring the kingdom of God as citizens of God's garden kingdom that's being restored. And we're doing that kingdom work. We're bringing that kingdom work by doing restoration. Okay, let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning after reading an Old Testament passage, which I grew up feeling like those were really hard to understand, and I wasn't really quite sure what the point of all of it was and what it even meant for us today. But I'm praying by your goodness, through your spirit, that we have new insight into this old passage from 1 Samuel about this woman, this evil man, and then a man of God who was on the path of evil, that we have new insight that helps us today and tomorrow and for years to come to help our brothers and sisters. You've appointed us to do that work. I pray that this will help at least encourage us and at least see that we ought to speak up. We ought to speak up with your words towards one another, if nothing else. We're appointed to that task. So please continue our motivation. Please prompt us to act at the right time. Help us to discern what's good and what's evil. Open our eyes up in wisdom to see and to know who needs help and how we can specifically and effectively intervene with your aid. We pray all of this through Christ. For me, and there's a part for you. All right. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, the one who loved us and gave us encouragement and good help of our grace, encourage our hearts and establish us in every good work and word. Let us go forth in confidence. Thanks be to God.